All right, Acts chapter 23 is where we are today. <clears throat> Acts chapter 23, we have been studying how that Paul, after making his speech on the steps of Antonia to uh, the multitude that had uh, tried to beat him, and well, did beat him, tried to kill him, uh, Lysias, the Roman commander, took him before the Sanhedrin here in chapter 23. Uh, in the midst of the Sanhedrin, Paul brings up the resurrection of the dead being the source of uh, the issue surrounding why all of this trouble has arisen over Paul. Uh, Paul knew very well that there was a difference between what the Pharisees believed and the Sadducees. Keep in mind, Paul was extremely well taught. He was extremely well versed in not just Old Testament, but also in the beliefs of the different sects of the Jews. And so he would have known full well that when he perceived that half of the Sanhedrin was Pharisee, half was Sadducee, he knew that this was going to cause an issue. He wasn't lying. He was absolutely telling the truth. When, he boiled every, when you boil everything down, the, the, the hope of the New Testament, the hope of the gospel is the resurrection of the dead. And that really was a primary division between the Sadducees and the Pharisees as well. I mean, it's hard to have something in common when with people who claim to be of the same belief structure as you believe the same book as you when their entire view of that for instance the old testament mosaic law the promises were not coming from a spiritual divine being i mean the sadducees didn't believe in a spiritual being they believed in the resurrection everything was physical Okay, even, even of the fulfillment of the prophecies and all the nations that are being blessed, all that, everything was physical. For the Jews, there was that spiritual side of things, and that didn't, or for the Pharisees, there was that spiritual side of things. So, so that, that, that was already a source of some friction and issues between the Pharisees and Sadducees anyway. But within the Sanhedrin, as Paul brings that up, and he was being honest, this calls an uproar. And the outcry was so loud that uh, Lysias had to go in and grab uh, uh, Paul, verse 9. We see the loud outcry. The scribes of the Pharisees say, we find no evil in this man. Uh, if a spirit or an angel spoke to him, let us not fight against God. So Lysias goes down. He's worried about Paul's safety. There's a great dissension. I'm guessing there's a lot of yelling. Uh, I don't know specifically if any violence had broken out, but I don't know so much if it was against Paul as much as it was Paul was in the midst of them and the two sides were going at it. Okay, maybe not necessarily hand fighting or anything, but, but definitely it was getting rowdy. The Pharisees would have had no reason to try to beat up Paul. He, Paul was supporting their belief in the resurrection. Uh, Sadducees, yeah, they, they might have had reason to, to try to uh, uh, attack Paul. But anyway, Lysias goes in with soldiers, takes them by force from among them, takes them back to Antonia. Okay? Then we see in verse 11, the following night, the Lord comes to Paul. This is a very, at least as far as what Luke records for us, and for that matter throughout the rest of the New Testament after Jesus has been resurrected and ascended to heaven, Jesus, no, notice it says, it, it doesn't even say as what happened on the road to Damascus, the bright light. It says the Lord stood by him. This is extremely uh, unique occasion. The fact that, I mean, we know Stephen was allowed kind of a glimpse into heaven and saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God back in Acts chapter 7. Uh, seeing Jesus raised from the dead, uh, after he ascended from heaven, this is a very unique circumstance. Uh, and not to mention the fact of Jesus speaking directly to Paul anyway after the road to Damascus. As far as what we know, as far as what's been recorded, Jesus speaking directly to Paul in this way, uh, aside from having taught him the gospel in Arabia and so forth, this is, this is a unique occasion. And so when we see in verse 11 that he... Now, not even through the Spirit, not through an angel, but Jesus himself says, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And as we ended last week, we discussed the fact this must have given Paul not just confidence, but also it's, it's a shift of determination. Now he was determined to go to Jerusalem and then let the chips fall where they may, let God's will be done. But now... There's the determination, he knows he's supposed to go to Rome. 
And so all of his future uh, talks, everything he does, his dialogue going forward, he knows that that's going to be his ultimate goal. Okay. And so when you think about the fact that later, when it comes to Felix and, and Agrippa and Paul appealing to Caesar, uh, Paul knows full well. And so that, that you think about Paul knew very well that by appealing to Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen, he's, it was lawful. Okay, that was his, his uh, prerogative to do this. Despite that, and remember what, Agrippa, what it was that Agrippa said, this man may have been released had he not uh, um, uh, appealed to Caesar. That's the very thing Paul didn't want. Okay? Paul knew he had to get to Rome. Whereas, had Jesus never revealed this to Paul, Paul might not have appealed to Caesar, and he might have been released, and who knows what would have happened after that. And so this was all part of the will of God, and Paul knew it. All right, yes, Debbie. Um, the question stood by him. Did that a literal stood by him as opposed to appear to him? And I, that's just a curiosity. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's a literal stood by him. Um, let's look at this term here. I don't want to see what's new. All right, let's see. What verse is this? Acts chapter 23, verse what now? 11. 11. This term, to place at, place upon, place over, to stand by, be present, to stand over one, uh, to be at hand, uh, to stand, to be present. I mean, it, 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 to me it sounds like he's standing next. It's not like it's a bright light. Uh, it's not like it's by an angel. Okay, This is Jesus actually there with Paul. And I, I would presume, well, it, it, I think it's the vision of him, okay? Not, not that Jesus literally came back to earth to stand by him. I, I, I see where you're going now. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's the vision of Jesus being next to him is how I see Paul perceiving this. You know, it's not like Paul was seeing an angel and then Jesus was speaking to him through the angel. That's not how Luke describes that. Okay, Jesus, the, the, the vision of him, I, hate, I, I don't want to use the term apparition because it makes like, it sound like Jesus was just a ghost. That's, that's, that's not the case. But the, the, the vision of him, Paul, kind of like a communication from heaven to Paul via this vision of him standing next to him. Okay, any thoughts on that? I mean, the fact that Jesus, it, it wasn't just in, in his head. That, that, and that's the point. That's what Luke's bringing out, is the fact this isn't just being spoken from the Holy Spirit to Paul. However that communication took place, however Paul perceived that communication, whether it was a voice in his head or however it was, that's not what being, what's being described here in verse 11. It's Jesus, there was some form of Jesus next to him. Again, I, I look at this kind of like, a, like a, a, a vision, an apparition type of thing. Uh, that, that Jesus communicated to Paul. Just in my mind, I'd always, you know, going through this, and for some reason that jumped out at me this time, but before it's like Jesus appeared to him, which is different than stood by him. And I just was curious if, if that was the literal stood by him. Yeah, well, I would definitely not go that far, because if Jesus had come from heaven to stand by Paul, then that would be Jesus coming back to earth. And that, that, that didn't take place. And so it was the Lord, his presence was, was standing next to Paul. The, the, the vision of him, however you want to phrase that, it's not that Jesus literally left heaven to come back to earth, which would be the second coming. Okay, so yeah, that is definitely a, a difference between those two. Nolan, I saw your hands a second ago. Would it be just somewhat similar to the accounts of Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus? Jesus appeared to him. In a bright light. Back at that point, he could not. He saw no man because he was blind. Right. But Jesus is there. Right. Speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, the, the yeah, Jesus w was speaking from that bright light, kind of like. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm not going to use that analogy. All right, verse eleven. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. The first thing he did was, you know, he started with him, but yeah. all of a sudden appeared. Yeah. So, peace be with you. You know, that was right. the first thing he said was, how do you sneak up on somebody? 
And well, not well, scare, and, and, not scare them. and the doors were shut. <laughs> exactly. And so I see this just like you did then. Be a good cheer. I'm, you know, I'm here. Yeah. And then he talks to him about, you know, yeah. his plan. But I, I see the same expression like you did back then of how do you break the sudden appearance yeah. Of, yeah. without, you know, dropping dead. You know? Yeah. You know, well, get started, yeah. And, and Jesus did that. Yeah. And there may have been more to this dialogue as well. I mean, we don't hear Paul's response, but you know Paul had to respond. You know, thank you, Lord, or, you know, however, what, however, what it was that he would have responded to this. There had to be some sort of a, a response from Paul. Luke just records the, the, what we need to know of that dialogue. You know, but there might have very well have been, you know, Paul responding, and Jesus may have said something else, encouraging Paul or whatnot. But this is what we need to know of that conversation. And so when he says, be of good cheer, Paul, you know, again, to kind of break the ice, so to speak, hey, I'm, I'm here. Uh, also, again, not to say that Paul was discouraged or, or depressed or whatever, but at the same time, when Jesus tells you, hey, be of good cheer, even though you're going through hardship, you're going through persecution, be of good cheer. That's encouraging. You know, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's edifying. That, that, that builds you up and strengthens you. No matter how strong you may already be, that makes you even stronger. So, anything else through verse 11? All right, verse 12. When it was day, now, verses 12 on through verse uh, 20 or so, I want you to note the situation here in verse 12 and following. And this is a really interesting unique uh, situation because ultimately Lysias was likely going to send Paul to Caesarea anyway. I mean, that's just one of those things that, 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 that Lysias didn't have much recourse in terms of trying to figure out what was going on. I, I got to find out what's happening. I don't, there has to be some kind of formal proceedings to figure this out. And Lysias has done everything he's could. He tried to find out from the people. That didn't work. He tried to find out from the, the law of the land, so to speak, the Sanhedrin. That didn't work. So his next best option would be to send him on to Caesarea and to uh, Felix. But what we see in verse 12, when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. So at this point, and really, I believe, at the point that the Roman commander Lysias found out Paul was a Roman citizen, Paul was no longer under arrest. Now he was under protective custody. Okay, remember, the multitude had tried to kill him before. Well, the Sanhedrin, well, particularly the Sadducees, have reason to kill him as well. So at this point, his being in the barracks, and I don't believe he's in chains, I don't believe he's imprisoned, again, that would have had major repercussions for Lysias and the, and the Romans involved. So I believe Paul's, he's in a room, he, he's under protection because of this very reason. There were some Jews that bound together are uh, bound themselves under an oath, saying they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. A lot of times we just say 40. Luke says there was more than 40. So 41, 42, 43, you know, between 41 and 50, I would say. If it had been 50 or more, he'd have said there was more than 50 that formed this conspiracy. So between 41 and 49 people were involved in this. Verse 14, they came to the chief priests and elders, and notice that it doesn't sound as if they, these 40 some odd men are involved in the Sanhedrin themselves. Okay, it's not like these are a bunch of Sadducees from the Sanhedrin who were mad at Paul. This is still left over from a couple days before from the multitude that had tried to kill him to begin with. They come to members of the Sanhedrin, primarily the chief priests and the elders, and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest that the commander, or suggest to the commander, that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Notice that they don't go to the Sanhedrin itself. Okay? Because half the Sanhedrin would have been against this idea, the Pharisees. Okay? They were not in favor of killing Paul. The Sadducees probably would have been. But the Pharisees, not so much. So notice they go to individuals that they knew they could trust about this uh, assassination scheme. Okay? 
He comes, they come to the chief priests and the elders. These would have been individuals who, first of all, would most likely have been Sadducees and were certainly in favor of punishing Paul because they view Paul as a traitor and he is deserving of death. That's why they went to them to start with. So you need, and I, I'm convinced that this isn't even go to the Sanhedrin, tell them the plan. No, I think they lied to the Sanhedrin. I think that's the intention. Go to, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander. And I'm thinking the chief priest and the elders, they go to the Sanhedrin and say, hey, you know what, why don't we have Paul come back? Let's talk about this again. We'll, we'll try to all be civil. We'll try to get to the bottom of this and, and take care of it. That, that, that's, that, that's my thought process because the council, the entire council would not have gone along with this. Half the council wouldn't have. The Pharisees would not have gone along with that. So, uh, as though you're going to make further inquiries concerning him, we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So the chief priests, the elders, they're aware of this conspiracy. These 40-some-odd men, 41-plus men, are involved in this. Uh, I do not believe that the Pharisees of the Sanhedrin are. But notice in verse 16, when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. This is the first we hear about Paul having any blood family, much less blood family, in Jerusalem. Okay? So Paul has a sister. This is his nephew. All right? If Paul was a Pharisee, then what is the likelihood of his sister and her nephew, or his nephew being a Pharisee as well? All right? I'm pretty certain that they were Pharisees too. That being the case, somehow, he hears about how this is all going down. Again, I don't believe that his nephew is a part of the Sanhedrin Council itself, but somehow he heard about it. Okay? So-and-so told so-and-so who told, hey, Paul's nephew, this is what's going on. I don't know. Okay? I don't know how it happened, but Paul heard, or, uh, Paul's nephew heard about it. Then Paul, verse 17, called one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. When I pictured this, you know, you know, for growing up, I always pictured Paul in prison with the bars, and his son is talking to him through the bars, and so Paul has to come. Paul's not imprisoned, okay? He's in the barracks. He's not in, in the jail. He's not in the prison. He's not chained or shackled, but he is under protective custody, and they allowed family to come see him because you can generally trust family, unless the mafia. So in verse 17, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. Paul didn't want to call for Lysias, okay? Not so much that Lysias wouldn't necessarily believe him. It's just a matter of take it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, okay? It's always good to get first-hand information, not second- or third-hand information. So the centurion, verse 18, took Paul's nephew, brought him to the commander, and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Verse 18, when he says prisoner, I don't believe that that means he's in shackles. Again, this is not, not like he's a criminal, okay? He's under guard in the sense that he's being protected, all right? So when he says Paul the prisoner, he's referring to the guy we have in protective custody. He's not referring to the criminal because he hasn't been accused of anything. Again, that would have been against Roman law. So verse, 18, or verse 19, the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And again, as far as we can tell, at no point is it conveyed from Paul to the centurion or from Paul's nephew to Lysias that, there's a, that, that Paul and his nephew are related. Not that they're hiding it, but that, that doesn't, that's not the point. That's not the, the purpose. Okay? It, it doesn't seem like he knows who Paul's nephew is specifically. So, verse 20, he said, The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. Do not yield to them. For more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. Presumably, Lysias knew that this was someone who, was, who Paul trusted because they let him in to start with. And it's very likely there was some kind of a law in place that only family or, or some sort of relationship had to exist to visit somebody in protective custody, as is this case. So he knew this was somebody Paul trusted. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so presumably, yeah. Been a connection of him being maybe a Roman that might 
give him credibility. Sure. Yeah, that could be. That's a good point. Uh, presuming, and again, it doesn't say half sister or you know stepsister or anything else. So presuming this is his full sister, then his sister also would have been born a Roman citizen, which would have meant her, ne- meant her son would have been born a Roman citizen. So yeah, that would make sense that this young man, however old he was, also was a Roman citizen by birth as well. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know how that would, that might have uh, had an impact on that situation as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to be able to speak, yeah, as, a, as a, just a common Jew, you know, he might not have had that opportunity. But because he is a Roman citizen, then that's, that's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else so far through verse 16-ish so far? All right, and we're going to go back through this because I want to point out something to you when we're finished with this account. So uh, notice, um, let's see, verse, uh, where am I? Verse 20. So the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow. Okay, again, the, 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 he's warning or he's telling Lysias about this. Presumably, Lysias has not heard about this yet. Okay, the message from the, the, the council hasn't reached Paul, uh, so Lysias yet. Hey, bring him down. At least I assume that's the case because he's, the, the nephew's recounting, here's what has been agreed to. They have agreed to ask you to bring down to the council Paul as though they're going to inquire more fully about him. Again, I believe firmly this was a conspiracy among the Sadducees, primarily the chief priests and the elders, that the Pharisees didn't know anything about it. Okay? They would have gone along with it. Sure, we'll bring him back down and we'll talk. Verse 21, do not yield to them for more than 40 of them. When he says them, I don't believe these are of the Sanhedrin. But again, talking about the Jews, all right? 40 of them lie in wait, men who have bound themselves by an oath. They will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. Now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So when you get the message, okay, you need to be aware when you respond that they're going to be, that they've got all this set up. So when you bring him out of the barracks, and presumably they're going to wait until he's down. Remember how we looked at the schematic a couple weeks ago of the temple and its relationship to uh, Antonia, the barracks. Once uh, Paul is taken outside of the barracks, outside that gate, and they're back in the temple proper, presumably somewhere between there and wherever the Sanhedrin met, which wouldn't have been in the temple, it would have been somewhere in Jerusalem, and they come out either out of the, the courtyard of the temple or out of, through the gate, there's going to be 40-some-odd men there to kill Paul. Okay, now, whatever general escort that the centurion had planned apparently wouldn't have been enough. Okay, wouldn't have been enough to protect Paul, at least. They may all the rest of them have been killed, but that wouldn't matter. As long as Paul dies, the rest of them don't care. So, do not yield to them, he says. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. So, verses, uh, uh, what was it, verse uh, 12 on through verse 22. Notice how even though God specifically isn't mentioned, notice the providence that is obviously involved here. Okay, when we talk about providence and we talk about Esther and Mordecai, you know, God's not mentioned specifically as having done anything in there, yet God was there the whole time. All right? Well, verses 12 on through 22, you have the same type of thing. When I think about this occasion, I think about Esther and Mordecai because notice these men, they say they're going to kill Paul. Now, notice what just happens. Paul's nephew, well, first of all, Paul has a nephew in Jerusalem. Okay? Remember, Paul was from Tarsus. I don't know if his whole family was sent to Jerusalem, if it was just Paul. However it was, Paul's nephew was there and just happened to somehow find out about all of this. He goes to Paul to tell Paul about it. Paul asks the centurion, take him to the commander. Well, the centurion listens. Whether he was bound as a Roman citizen to do so, I, I don't know. But the centurion listens. Then Lysias was willing to listen, we see. And then in verse 21 and 22, the commander listens, and of course, he doesn't want this to happen. So then when we see in verse 23, the preceding events and how all this was planned out, and yet, somehow or another, it was the whole uh, ambush, the conspiracy, was all happened for nothing. Like it does sound like a good plan. It does sound like a good plan. I mean, this is the type of stuff you, you, know, you, you t- tend to watch on the government conspiracies documentaries and stuff, right? So in verse 23, 
he called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night. So how many soldiers total do we have going? 470 soldiers total. 200 soldiers, 200 spearmen, 70 horsemen. Okay, this is not a small group of men. This is a, this is a large contingent. And you got to figure that the, the Roman commander, generally there are around 1,000 soldiers at any given time in, in Antonia to start with. This is nearly half of the amount of soldiers they had stationed in Jerusalem. Half of his garrison he's sending to protect Paul. Okay, that's significant. That is very significant. And so in verse uh, 23, go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Okay, what time would that have been? Okay, 9 p.m., right? It's interesting because there's different thoughts on this regarding whether this would have been 9 p.m. by Jewish time, that would have been the third hour of the night. However, if you go by Roman time, this would have been 3 a.m.-ish, okay? So it depends on how Lysias, whether he kind of set his clock by Jewish time or not. I'm not sure. Uh, there's kind of a mixture of thoughts on this. But it either would have been 9 p.m. I tend to think that this would have been 3 a.m., okay? I tend to think it would have probably been later, only because 3 a.m., the likelihood of these men still being up and awake is much less than 9 p.m. Okay, and granted, there's a, there's a modern thought to that too. I mean, who goes to bed at 9 p.m.? Come on, Keith maybe. But you know, for everybody else, <laughs> for everybody else, the idea of, yeah, the day ended at 6, but that didn't mean everybody went to bed at 6. Okay? So I, again, it could be 9 p.m. That would have been by Jewish time. But if it had been, if we're talking about Roman time, it would have been 3 a.m. And so it just kind of depends on... Either way, it was at a time deliberately under the sh uh, shadow of night to be able to get away where these men couldn't see them. Okay, that was the point, regardless of what, what the clock said or the sundial said. Okay? So any thoughts so far through verse 23? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we talk about providence, and we often go to Old Testament to review providence. And, and, and a lot of that's because there's so many opportunities to observe the providence of God in the Old Testament. But that's not to say that God's providence isn't also shown. Obviously, ironically using that word because, you know, it's providence. It's, you can see it in some of these accounts where... When we get to chapter 27, when Paul is in the boat heading to, to Rome, we have the shipwreck and everything else. Remember how that Paul was told no one would be harmed? And yet in that account, there is no recording of a miracle saving those men. Providence, okay, saved those men. But there's no natural or suspension, there's no observable suspension of natural law. That is a miracle, okay? If it's not observed, which is to say, you know, I, I, I recently read a, a, some kind of an uh, article or something uh, about these people whose daughter, I think she was nine years old, had an incurable brain tumor the size of like a, a tennis ball or something, and she, it was incurable, they couldn't operate, nothing, they couldn't do anything, they only gave her a couple months to live, then the next time she went in, it was gone, there was just nothing there. The doctors couldn't, they didn't know, they didn't understand. It sh there should be something there, there's not. And everybody's accounting it as a miracle. Well, again, I'm not going to say God wasn't involved. These people may be religious. Of course, the article doesn't say that. But 
the thought process that could God have taken it away? He could have. But there would be no scan that ever showed it. All of a sudden being there and boom, it's gone. Not going to happen. That's an observable suspension of natural law. Natural law says something isn't just there and all of a sudden disappears. Okay, there's a storm and all of a sudden some man says, peace be still, and it's just gone. It doesn't happen that way. That's not natural. Okay, but what makes it a miracle is that we observe that suspension of natural law. Whereas providence would include power of God, whether indirect or direct, that cannot and would not be observed. Okay, so again, in this situation, how, how was it that this nephew happened to hear about this? I don't know. I don't know what the situation was. I don't know who he knew, who knew somebody else. I don't know. How is it that those men in chapter 27 are going to be spared from, being, from drowning? Everybody's going to be alive? That's, again, that goes back to God's power. And again, he had power over the waves. He had power over the water. Could he have indirectly or directly affected the water to not observably but to make sure that those men all were saved? Yeah. But again, that's the difference between a miracle and providence, is the observation aspect of it. If something's there, then it's gone. You're never going to actually be able to observe that, it disappearing. All right? Thoughts or questions on that part? Did I see a hand over here? No? I see your hand up? Okay. Okay. I just thought about it. I didn't read. Um, I always have... Uh, I mentioned this before, Bob Harkwriter's commentary on Acts, because it, it, it's actually not a commentary, it's a class book. Um, and it's actually a really good book, and I've, I've used it from time to time, looking at kind of, because he includes some of the history and, and some of the stuff like that. Uh, I didn't think to look at this from his perspective as far as the time. Um, had Lysias been willing to please the Jews, he would have, been, he would have allowed Paul's death. Uh, he protected him since Caesarea. Paul left Jerusalem to cover night. Okay, he, he tends to think this was the third hour of not being 9 p.m. under Jewish time. Um, so, yeah, however way you want to look at that. Again, whether Lysias would have set his sundial to Jewish time or Roman time, I don't know. But either way. All right, so verse 24 provide mounts to, for Paul, to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter in the following manner. So, uh, give Paul a horse, put him on it, take him, guard him with your lives to Felix. Okay, Felix is in Caesarea. Uh, there were actually, it's kind of confusing sometimes, there's actually two cities named Caesarea. The one he's talking about, Caesarea Maritima. Um, and in verse 26, so this is the letter that, that Lysias writes to Felix regarding the situation. Okay, now notice the wording of this, <laughs> because it's very interesting how Lysias words this in the best possible way to uh, omit some of the questionable things that had happened. So verse 26, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. That's accurate. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. Is that accurate? <laughs> no. <laughs> they rescued him. And they were going to scourge him, and it wasn't until a little bit later, when they're getting ready to scourge him, that, that Paul tells the centurion first that he was a Roman, and the centurion goes and tells Lysias he's a Roman. So, so that's not quite right. And remember, Paul was bound. He was imprisoned. Okay? So verse uh, 28, and when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. That is true, verse 28. Excuse the fact that he had found out he was a Roman citizen. Now we need to know what's going on because we can't hold him without cause. So verse 29, I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. <sighs> yeah, that's kind of true. Really, there wasn't really anything that you really gained from the understanding of what happened in the, uh, the midst of the Sanhedrin. This is a very broad, very vague uh, response or, or, or recounting from Lysias. Yeah, obviously it has something to do with their law, but that's the very thing he doesn't know what specifically is it that they're upset about. Okay, Lysias was there. He heard everything that was said, presumably. He heard what Paul said about the resurrection. He saw the, the council go crazy. Okay, so obviously, yes, it is about their law, but nothing was learned there. <laughs> okay, 
Verse 30, when it was told to me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Uh, presumably when he says this in verse 30, what he means is, you know, after the writing of this, by the time Felix gets it, this will have been true. He will have commanded his accusers to go, and, go to Caesarea and talk to Felix. Okay? At the time he writes this, I, I don't know that that's true, but by the time Felix gets it, it will be. Okay, because the next morning, he's going to be telling the, the Sanhedrin, you need to go to, or well, his accusers, go to Caesarea and talk to Felix about this. All right? So, thoughts with the letter. Okay, keep, keep in mind that just by binding Paul, they had broken Roman law. All right? Ignorance is no excuse. <laughs> you know, that, that phrase comes up quite a bit when it comes to law. It doesn't matter what law it is. Ignorance is no excuse. So, in this case, Lysias and those who were with him who had bound Paul, remember, as soon as they had heard they were about to scourge him, they heard that Paul was a Roman citizen, everybody but the centurion took off. They were, nope, nope, we don't want anything to do with this. And so the centurion warned the commander about it. Uh, so, Lysias was very careful in how he said this. He, he wasn't lying. He did find out he was a Roman citizen. It just it leads one to think that he found out he was a Roman citizen while he was being beaten by the mob in, in Jerusalem in the temple, uh, as a, or outside in the court of the temple, as, as, uh, uh, as opposed to what actually happened. Thoughts through the letter? Yes, sir? He's passing the buck. Yeah. To Felix, there will be a lot of passing of the buck. Sure. This is all over. I wonder, I think, if I understood you correctly, you thought that when Jesus said to Paul, you will testify uh, for me in Rome, that you would do so in chains or as a prisoner, uh, and that's why Paul yeah. appealed to... But that would be my assumption, that that's what Paul understood. Because you would think that Paul, at this point, especially because this happened after the Sanhedrin. So Paul has probably already gone through, well, now what is Lysias going to do next? <laughs> you know, he's tried to, to get the information from people. He's tried to get information from the Sanhedrin. The next logical step would be to appeal to a higher authority. Okay? And I don't blame Lysias for that. Okay? Lysias probably would have let him go if it hadn't been for the fact that the Jews would have killed him. Okay? Lysias not only didn't want that to happen, he couldn't let that happen for his own sake. Okay? This, not only would Lysias have been on the chopping block for that, literally, but also that very well could have caused the very rebellion and issues that led to the destruction of, of Jerusalem in 70 AD earlier than it was supposed to. Okay? If Paul had been killed by the Jews and he was a Roman citizen and that got back to Caesar, that could have caused everything to go crazy before it was supposed to. Okay? So Lysias, he knew what was at stake. And so I, I tend to think Paul understood that when he was going to be testifying in Rome, I, I tend to think that Paul knew, he understood what that meant, that this is, this is not going to end here, that this is going to go all the way to Rome. Yeah, not, not, and again, I wouldn't necessarily say, yeah, but the way they treat him, um, makes it, sometimes it sounds like he's a prisoner, but keep in mind, as a Roman citizen, he's not technically a prisoner. He's not accused, okay? he's not being beaten all the time or anything else. He is a Roman citizen. He is under protective custody, but at the same time, there is somebody who has ought or somebodies who have ought against him. So it's almost like he's kind of in limbo. He's not a criminal, but it's not like he's an innocent either, technically. Okay, he, he's kind of, he's been accused of something, but there's no specifics on it yet. Okay, so he's kind of in that limbo zone, and that will be the case all the way to Rome. Okay, all the way to Rome. Did you have anything else with that? Uh, it, it just seems to me through Paul's dealing with this situation, he is waiting for justice. He is waiting for someone to stand up and say, you're innocent. This is all bogus. Well, and... Yeah, uh, I and that could be that could be that Paul wanted to get away because you know of course he by this point he had already written to the Romans he said I, I intend to come to you you know he didn't know how he was going to get there so in his mind he may have still been thinking at this point I I, I want to be let loose so I can go where I need to go and eventually get to Rome and all this stuff so he may not have thought. It, it would have occurred the way it did. That's possible. Again, I tend to look at it that, especially after Jesus brings it out, 
connects it to, you've testified to me in Jerusalem. Well, how did that happen? Because of persecution. You've been arrested. This is the way Jesus says it. I, I, want, I, I tend to think that Paul connected that. It's all the same occurrence. That the, because of what's happened, I'm going to end up in Rome with all of this. But it, it, either way, it could be. Yeah. All right, anything else through verse 30? Verse 31. The soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day, yeah, I pronounced that right. Then the next day, they left the horsemen to go on with him uh, and return to the barracks. So the 400 men who were walking by foot, they go as far as Antipatris. I don't know. Let's see if I've got my, uh, if I've got Antipatris on here. I don't think I do. Yeah, I don't have Antipatris. There's, there's, you can see Caesarea Maritima, uh, or Maritima. That's Jerusalem uh, and Caesarea. Let's see, does my other map have uh, Antipatris on here? Yeah, there we go. Huzzah. I can't zoom in. Really? Okay. So anyway, you can barely see Antipatris here. There's Antipatris. There's, it looks like Antipatris is about halfway between Caesarea and Jerusalem. So you had 470 of them with Paul through the first half of the journey. Presumably, if those 40-some-odd men were going to attack, they would have, if, if they had happened to see Paul escape or whatever, it would have happened in that short amount of time, okay? or, or that, that amount of time going halfway to Antipatris. After that, the other 400 go back to Jerusalem. Keep in mind, about half of the garrison has gone. <laughs> so Jerusalem is being left a little unprotected, relatively speaking, okay, with these 470 uh, soldiers gone. The other 70 on horseback, okay, so, so the slowest part of the trip was his first half. The second half of the trip, the 70 and Paul, they went on horseback the rest of the way to Caesarea. So that probably took a lot, lot that was a lot faster of a trip than the first half was. So going back to our text here, <clears throat> they returned to the barracks. Then they came to Caesarea, so this would have been the 70 soldiers and Paul, delivered the letter to the governor. They also presented Paul to him, and when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. Talking about what province are you from, Paul? When he understood he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. So, Felix being the governor, he is, he is one of the authorities uh, involved. That's why he, when he asked what province Paul was from, and Paul says Cilicia, that means that, that Felix does have uh, uh, some jurisdiction here. Okay? Had he been from some other province in Asia Minor or in Greece or wherever, that probably would have fallen under somebody else's purview, and Felix wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. But the fact that he is from Cilicia, there is some jurisdiction for, for Felix here. Uh, so he commanded him to be kept in Herod's Praetorium, not in prison, okay, Again, the way the letter describes it, he's a Roman citizen. Felix didn't have the authority, would not have wanted to put him in prison. So again, this is house arrest, for lack of a better phrase, protective custody. That's how Paul's being treated here by Felix. And of course, we'll see in chapter 24 how a lot of this comes about uh, with Felix and with the accusers and, and so forth. Uh, so basically, now it's a, the court date has been scheduled, okay, now we're waiting for everybody to dot their I's and cross their T's and have everything taken care of so that we can have a hearing, for lack of a better phrase. All right? Anything through verse 35? Okay. Let's cover as best, maybe. Let's see if we can cover our questions here. Let's see, Acts chapter 23. And by the way, I think there's still copies of chapter 20, 24 and 25 out there in the back. Should be. Question one. Why does Paul... Oh, we already did question one. Um, question two. Why does Paul set the council at odds with the, within itself by appealing the resurrection of the dead? Because that was when you boil it all down. That's what it, what it was. Does Paul lie in saying this? No, he doesn't lie. What is the implication of Jesus' words to Paul in verse 11? And again, that may speak more to my perception of it that... The implication is that Paul was end up going to have to go to Rome because of what's taking place. And it could be as James described that, that you know, Paul may have thought, okay, well, so when I get out of this situation, eventually I'm going to go to Rome. Paul had already planned on going to Rome, and so I'll, I'll testify in Rome too. I, I, could be either way. 
Why do you suppose this, or how do you suppose this affected Paul's actions and words after this? Uh, I do think it certainly had a hand in his appealing to Caesar. Again, Paul would have been let go. Agrippa, Agrippa said as much. This man could have, would have been released had he not appealed to Caesar. Whether Paul understood that or knew that at the time, I don't think that makes much difference. He knew he ended up needed to go to Jerusalem, whether he, or to Rome, whether he knew it beforehand or not. By the time he appeals to Caesar, I know that had to, have to play a hand in it. Um, and then question four, the letter to Felix uh, Lysias was not completely truthful in his letter. Uh, he says that he found out he was a Roman citizen before he actually did. And he says it to save himself and those soldiers. All right, that's it. Chapter 23, we'll pick up chapter 24 next Sunday. Thank everybody for the thoughts and comments.